thank you very much. Um, let's go ahead and get started in the interest of everybody's time. We'll start with what everyone came here for, which is to hear about me, and I appreciate you doing that. Um, like uh, Nicole said, I am the uh, Water and Sanitary Products Manager today, uh, taking off the water hat and being strictly sanitary sewer. I've done that in different consulting roles prior to being um, in that role at XP for about 14 plus years. I'm saying this because I can still say it for a few more months. I'm officially the nuclear family by having two kids and one on the way, so I'm squeezing all the life out of that I can. And I'm a tinkerer. That's a picture of me when I'm dressed up, but usually I'm building and doing things in the sanitary sewer, like that thing, which is a depth meter. So you have a friend if you like sanitary sewers. That's oddly enough one of the things I really like to, uh, to do. Um, so let's get into uh, what this series looks like, like Nicole covered. So we're at the introduction level now. So you'll hear me reference several times during this presentation something that we'll cover in more detail in another presentation. We're trying to cover everything at, say, a 30,000 foot level. After the introduction, you see the next uh, sessions we have. We schedule one specifically to wet weather just because of um, all the joys that come with wet weather uh, analysis and characterization in a sanitary sewer system. And then we'll talk uh, just about calibration and then just about pumps or other real-time controls you may have in your system. And the final one we have right now is kind of a validation, data, archiving, best practices. However, by all means, comment either to me in an email as part of this webinar or otherwise. We'd like to collect people and continue to move people through this series. And so if there are anything that we could cover differently, we'll just continue to do that through the series. Um, and so and if there's a big enough topic, we'll just cover that at the end. So uh, more specific to this uh, introduction, I wanted to start with a poll. And I'm going to try to launch that and see if, um, if you can get stand up and get your uh, clicking fingers ready just to get an idea of what different parts of the sanitary sewer modeling ecosystem you have involvement in, all of them um, that you have. So I, I don't really expect too many people to be that involved um, in construction necessarily, but I want to see if, you, um, if you're just uh, bread and butter in one or if your interests kind of spread out over the others. And I won't, uh, I joked that I was going to wait until we had every single person uh, respond, but I don't really have all day, so we'll, I'll leave it open for a couple uh, more moments, and then we'll close it. Excellent. I will close that, and hopefully you'll, um, I'll share that so you can see what we've got. And a pretty good split, kind of what I expected between planning and design, and that's good. Um, a lot of places don't have a good, necessarily, uh, discussion between the planning and design groups, and so hopefully we can bridge that gap a little bit here. Also good to see um, some construction and some in the maintenance operation. So let me show you our agenda for today, and you'll have to somewhat excuse my liberal use of alliteration to try to keep things interesting for sanitary sewer. So we're going to start with just the physical basis of the system. And so I'm, I'm using all P's there, so I'll start with pipes, and I mean other connections, manholes, and things that connect those linear assets. This is, again, strictly from the physical standpoint. Then we'll talk about pumps and the other parts of those facilities. And then we'll talk about peaks or loads, so how the system operates. And then a little bit about what I'm calling preservation or the maintenance, the parts that aren't necessarily as directly um, related to uh, planning or hydraulic modeling, but there are some relation there. Of course, there are corollaries from the physical system to the modeling system, and I'm using L's there. So we'll start with limbs. Again, same idea, the pipes and manholes. And we'll get in the lifts or the facilities, then loads, and then the logic. So obviously, the modeling system has to have some kind of logic to be able to tell it how to function. That's kind of built into the human aspects of the physical system. And this, uh, the genesis, the idea of this talk here, and then the way that we're structuring this agenda is also through some experience with some of our support uh, portal requests and just showing some of the physical basis for why the model asks for certain things or behaves um, in certain ways. So with that, let's go ahead and get into the actual meat of the presentation. And first up is the pipes. 
and like I said, the other horizontal or linear assets. In this example, you can see a, a true separated system. So you can see the storm sewer system, and if you can see my little mouse pointer, showing, of course, what uh, stormwater people like to show is blue water. Uh, we're going to avoid the stormwater side. We're just strictly in the sanitary side. Um, obviously, some of you may have combined sewers, since that's a different set of issues. We're going to talk just on the separate storm sewer. And they show storm sewer in a lovely green shade here um, in this image. And you can also see some cracks in the pipe. And this is the more the main line that usually runs parallel to a road. There's lots of the system that comes from the house. So you can see the clean out and the lateral. This is obviously showing a pretty broken connection, uh, having been in the ground for some amount of time. Many times, the hydraulic model itself doesn't care or show any lateral connections. The laterals may connect into the manhole, or they may connect into the actual uh, collector line or trunk line of the sewer. Generally speaking, those aren't shown on a per house basis. Those generally aren't metered on a per house basis. So we're showing that, although, as you would expect, most of the flow, not just dry weather, but wet weather, comes from those residential and commercial connections. So it's quite a, a, a complex system, especially if you get into the appurtenances, the valves, and some of the fittings that actually get the water from the house or the business into the lawn. And so what are we trying to do? Well, in, in the most theoretical sense, we're just trying to get flow from point A to point B while minimizing cost. And cost just isn't construction cost, it's the total life of the system. So that might be a clay pipe, like you see on the left. It could be a PVC pipe on the right. There's lots of variables that would define why you want to build uh, using a certain material. And so here is a concise example of some of the selections. So for materials, you might have a, a plastic, PVC, or HDPE, you may have clay or concrete, uh, and generally there, are, there can be lots of reasons behind that, but in simple terms, cost is obviously a factor. Capacity could change based on how rough that material is. You have environmental concerns. Um, you're not going to see a lot of metal pipe or cast iron pipe anymore. Usually you're going to have some type of mortar or something that's going to try to protect that pipe from the environment, the hydrogen sulfide and other corrosive gases. The grade is important, of course. That's usually a function of the velocity that you need, which can be from a capacity standpoint on the high end of things as well as maintenance on the low end of things. We generally like to see some minimum velocity so that things that are in the wastewater that um, are more of a settled solid will actually move. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Of course, diameter. And this is just a nominal idea. Four inch, it might be something coming from the lateral from your house into whatever your actual system is. And those can get quite large. They're generally circular just because, again, of what is conveyed in the pipe. The lengths can vary. You might have 20 foot sections of pipe. Again, if you're designing, you might be designing on a 20 foot stick of pipe basis. But you're certainly not modeling every single stick of pipe uh, in 20 foot sections. You're generally in a, a manhole to manhole or a pipe grade break type uh, concern. But you might have a really long stretch of pipe. If you're slip lining something, you might have a long stretch of plastic pipe. And then the depth of that will also vary. Not to say that you can't have it less than four feet, but generally speaking, there's some minimum amount of cover. And not that you can't have it deeper than 50 feet. I've seen that. But generally, that's going to become a cost and environmental issue with getting it that deep to be gravity. I mentioned gravity. Of course, that's one option. You can also have pressurized pipes. Those are usually called force mains. So uh, discharging from a lift station or a pump station could be something called a force main, which is actually pressurized. So if you want to pump on a strange grade or up and down um, or around something or you just need more capacity, there's lots of reasons you can have that. Um, there are also subsets of that type of force main system, like a grinder pump system. Some of those we'll cover in just a minute. And then you can have a siphon, um, which is another type that you might have under low water crossings um, or other areas where there's just not a better option to get the flow through the. So those are the, the pipes. Those need connections. They're one type of connection that we're most familiar with is the manhole. And so in, in concept, if you see um, a drawing of a manhole or a plan for manhole. There, there are actually quite a few different parts to the manhole. Generally, if you're just a hydraulic modeler, you may just think of a manhole as a dot with a nominal volume in it. But there's really lots of different pieces to the whole life of a manhole. 
and that really gets into the maintenance and the operation aspects. But you'll see some kind of concept of it, and then you'll have it installed. So this is a nice looking installation where they're in the midst of installing the manhole. Um, looks beautiful, hand laid base there. And then of course you have what it looks like after some amount of time. In this example flow coming from top down and from left to the right. Um, this is a brick manhole. There can be different materials, of course, but so sure, after time in that environment, different things are going to happen. You can also see from inspection of this manhole that right now it looks like it's maybe a third to half full, um, but just from looking at the bench there, you can see that certainly it surcharges under different conditions, and we'll talk about that when we get into the loads. Variables exist in the manhole realm, just like pipes. They're going to be similar, so you might have a plastic or fiberglass or concrete or brick material. That would just vary again based on the same reasons you'd expect for pipes. Um, and you can have that precast, so you can have that built at an actual uh, contractor or facility who builds those and brings them out to the site and they're just installed, or if you, especially if you have a very strange kind of connection or junction box that might be cast in place. Diameters are, are generally standardized, especially of course for precast. Um, and, and pretty much a lot of the manholes are standardized. I mean, the cone might be uh, concentric or eccentric, and the rim itself may be slightly different, but generally they're the same. Uh, the depths are going to vary along with the pipes. So if you have a 50-foot deep pipe, that means you're going to have a 50-foot deep manhole, generally speaking. And then there are other features, again, that I covered earlier that don't necessarily show up in the model, but are very important. So a drop structure. I see that most frequently in laterals. So if there's a new construction and you bring a lateral from a house into a manhole, it can penetrate the manhole 10 feet above the invert of the manhole and just drop straight down. Simpler than having to dig and find the uh, connecting line. But certainly you could have two different lines that come in at vastly different elevations. So that's the drop structures that you'll see and those can vary based on the conditions, the quality of the, uh, the effluent water there. You have ladders and meters and sensors. It's basically an opportunity for you to get into the system, so a lot of people make good use of that opportunity. That's not the only structure or point structure you could have in the physical system. There are others. So uh, in the laterals themselves, which again don't typically show up in a model other than as the way to convey flow into a manhole, but they're not actually physically there. So in other words, flow will just appear in a manhole, but it came from a lateral. And then you'll see things like cleanouts. So cleanouts are basically very small relative to a manhole, but they're small maintenance access areas, large enough to get a, uh, a TV inspection line in perhaps, or to be able to jet or pump out to clean, but generally not any bigger than that. A, a lot of those will be private, so they will be on the private, uh, the customer's property. At some times, though, you will see those in um, in a more of a public area if you just have a small line and you need to have a clean out again for access for cleaning. You also see some kind of stranger things. I know in, in the Oklahoma area they'll have lamp holes that may exist other areas, but basically um, quite an old concept in its original intent, which is a hole that you could shine a lamp light in and use a mirror to be able to inspect the actual line. Um, and so an interesting uh, URL there, if you are interested enough in some of the, the ways that uh, problems were solved hundreds of years ago. A lot of the problems haven't changed that much. Some of the solutions have become a little more high-tech. So speaking of some more high-tech, I suppose, you can have meter boxes. And in this, I'm speaking not at the pump station. So again, we'll cover pumps specifically. But you can have other type of uh, meter boxes to estimate flow or to estimate other differential pressures, etc. You might have those type of features in the system. may not necessarily show up in the model, but it's good to know about their existence. So that's the, the physical part, the pump part of the system, the pipe part, excuse me. Let's talk about pumps. And again, there's a whole talk on pumps, so we're going to try to cover this in a few minutes. There are two basic types we'll cover and that you usually see in the world of sanitary. Uh, one is the uh, wet pump, uh, wet uh, well station. So what you'll see here is, and this is a picture of a kind of a subset of that, which is a grinder system. And so you'll see this sometimes in areas where the terrain or the, the relief is such that 
it's going to be really hard to put in gravity systems, and it may also be really hard to put in even lift stations, full lift stations, um, or maybe it's a very small area where you don't really want to have to put in all the effort for a lift station. So you can have individual grinder systems that will grind and under a low head push that flow up into the gravity sewer. In a bigger version, which you'll see is something like this, um, in this installation, the pump itself is submerged in the wet well. So the wet well is the cylinder that you can see off to the right. The, in this schematic, flow comes in from the far right and begins to fill up that wet well. And that wet well is just a term for storage. So if you're not familiar with that, basically the storage aspect of the lift station or the pump station is called the wet well. This looks like a, a precast uh, wet well, and they can be. They can be different shapes and sizes. Those pumps actually sit in the wet well, and they have level indicators in there. So as the water fills up, it tells the pump to turn on. The pump pumps up and out of the discharged uh, headers there. You see the actual motor is not submerged. It's in this brick enclosure here. And then off to the left is the force main. That's the pressurized, under positive pressure, pumping out. This has two pumps, so you might hear that referred to as a duplex pump station. Generally what happens is one pump operates at a time, and then it cycles, so one pump may run for a prescribed amount of time, and then it will stop, and the next pump will run, just to keep both pumps operating and both motors running. If you have a, and that's under dry weather, typical day condition. Um, so here, oddly enough, in Portland, it's not raining, um, so a dry weather condition, it would be running one pump and then the other. If you get a heavier rainfall event and their pumps are designed well, and again, we'll cover that in the pump section, but then you may run both pumps at the same time. In this example, and in a lot of examples, the only thing you can really see um, on the top side is the um, electrical panel, and you might also have a, a backup generator and some of the logic. So that's in the green structure there that's enclosed. You'll have your logic and your electrical controls. So other than potential odor concerns, a lot of people don't really notice um, lift stations, especially the wet style lift station like this. There's an access panel that's cut away on top of the wet well. If you needed to service one of those motors on a downside of things, you're going to need to put a crane in and pull it up, and that's the way you're going to service it. So you're going to have to make sure it's not operating and you're going to pull it up that way. The other option, oh, sorry, this is the same example, but in more of a profile view. Again, you can see that the, um, the pump is actually in the water, and the float switches are also in the wet well. So everything exists there. It's just a smaller footprint. Generally, from a construction standpoint, it costs less. But you can also have the dry pit station. So in this example, you can see the same concept of the circular wet well. You can see the pipe. Um, from the right adding flow in, but now all you see is the suction side of the pump itself. So the pump and the motor are both dry, um, and that takes up a bigger footprint, so it might cost more, but it also allows you through this access panel to get in and be able to inspect and do work on both pumps and motors at the same time without actually having to you know, drain down the wet well or bring over a crane and pull it up. So the number of pumps kind of covered before, that's obviously something of interest. You could have that duplex system, triplex. You could have several pumps. Um, you may have more than one discharge or force main. You may have operational controls. They can get quite complex uh, in that operation. And so that operation and logic is certainly something worth covering. In fact, I thought it was worth covering enough that we were going to have its own talk just about that. You can have other variables, too. So seeing a lot more now than, say, 10 years ago, the proliferation of the variable frequency drive pump into the sanitary realm. That's existed what I'd seen more often in water, but the concept here is that the motor itself is changing how often um, the RPMs are, which can allow you to pace the, the pump itself. So you can have the pump change the flow uh, with using the same pump rather than trying to run multiple pumps on multiple curves. So it's something you can also model, and we'll cover that in a subsequent talk. So that's the whirlwind, right? That's obviously not giving you enough to do anything specifically useful, but it gives you an idea of some of the, the parts of the physical part of the pumps. We'll cover those more and more detail. Uh, I think that's three or four sessions from now. So now let's talk about the peaks. So again, stylizing and conceptualizing here. The first thing we have 
and you can have is groundwater. So if you didn't know, many, many uh, gravity sewer systems are not at all uh, watertight. Some of them aren't even airtight, to be honest. Um, and, and you can see this sometimes if you've done inspections, you can inspect a brand new neighborhood that has uh, sanitary lines in and they haven't even put houses up yet. And if you pull manholes, you can still see water flowing through the system. And that can be coming from groundwater or from some other type of water that's in the actual ground and seeping into the pipe. On top of that, you can also have dry weather flows. So these are flows that you expect to treat from human sources, so residential, commercial, otherwise. And then the last thing, and usually what ends up pushing the design of the actual capacity of the pipes and the stations, is that unique wet weather event that happens in a more sporadic time frame. So again, the, the three types that we'll talk about are, are the ground, ground water, which can be more seasonal. So say Portland, Seattle area, you're going to have a wet season, you're going to have a dry season. So if you're doing long-term metering of your, of your pipes, you'll actually notice a gradual change over time. That's not something you may capture in a week or a month worth of data, but if you have enough data, you'll see that change over time. And then you have what I'll call dry weather, and that can be confusing. Some people will call it average daily flow. Some people will say dry weather, where by definition there is no wet weather ever. Um, so that's kind of a decision by decision, project by project, but we'll say dry weather, so strictly water that's coming from intended human use. And then there's the wet or the variable water that is rainflow derived inflow and infiltration getting into the system. So that's the different loads into the system and we'll cover those a little bit more on the modeling side. We'll cover that in just a minute. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover was this preservation. So you do the effort and energy of doing long-range planning, and then you do short-range planning. You decide what to build. You design it. You install it. Now you have to maintain it. So here's an obvious example of leaks. I'm sure many people have seen leaks. This is a leak in a joint of this pipe, uh, a pretty decent-sized leak, um, but certainly not filling up the capacity of the system. So sometimes people may ask, well, what's the problem if it's relatively clean water and it's just filling up this little bit of capacity? Well, obviously, if that ends up hitting a pump station, you're paying electrical costs and maintenance costs on the pumps. And no matter what happens, you're going to have to treat that water at some point. So you have that treatment cost. You can also have blocks. A lot of times that will happen from the acronym FOG, fats, oils, and greases. And so and a lot of municipalities and utilities have tried to combat that with some cease the grease or similar type of campaign. A concept being if you take hot uh, cooking oil and pour it down your drain and then pour some boiling water behind it, sure it's good for you, it may make it out of your lateral that you own and, and are responsible for, but by the time it hits the city or the authorities, larger collector, it cools down and becomes a nice big block of grease. You may have seen some of the articles and some of the pictures over in the United Kingdom about the fatberg, so the gigantic multi-ton um, piece of fat that was built up. So that can obviously cause a blockage. Roots can also be a, a significant problem. Trees are smart. They like water. And if you have water flowing in pipes, they have water to access. So that can be a problem too. You also have breaks and failures. In fact, I had been surprised previously to see that a lot of overflows occurred at lift stations more frequently during dry weather events than wet weather just because of failures in the electrical system. I, I touch on public-private. I won't wage, uh, wade too far into that debate, but there is a, you know, a gray area for a lot of uh, utilities where a lot of the I&I, &I, so the inflow comes from purposely illegal connections or inadvertent, poorly maintained connections. So a lot of the problems originate on the private side of things, and the utility would like to be able to fix that. But a lot of times, bonds and other uh, fiscal instruments are tied to public projects. And so you have this issue where you want to fix something, but it's on private property versus the public responsibility. Um, certainly it's an issue to the point where if you're a member of WEF, they have a lot of good information in their library strictly on this um, private property issues. Sustainability is uh, a big issue. It's probably a preaching to the choir issue in this group, but certain to say that if you build something that you expect to last 50 years, generally you don't start saving for it after one year. I know for me, 
I buy a house, it has an air conditioner, air conditioner won't last forever, I don't immediately start saving to buy a new air conditioner, um, but it's a much bigger problem when larger cities, uh, municipalities don't do it for a long amount of time. So on the life curve of some of our linear and fixed assets and rotational ones, it's getting to be dangerous as far as being sustainable. There are some guidances out there. One of the, the best known ones, I should say, is the CMOM, which stands for Capacity Management Operation and Maintenance. That's a nice EPA program that you can use. You can use it at your own discretion, or if you have enough overflows, you can be um, nudged into using it at less of your own discretion. Um, but that's really good. It basically covers everything we've talked about so far. You know, the management and the mapping and the idea of where things are, as well as maintenance and the sustainability kind of all wrapped into one. Thought being if you can be as proactive as possible with uh, management and maintenance of your system, hopefully you'll have less problems with the system. That's the, the idea, anyway. Okay, so that's a lot of talk, and I, I've tried my best to avoid using the, the M word model up to this point, just to cover the, the rough idea. Again, knowing that a lot of this will be covered in a more uh, detailed way um, when we get into some of the specifics on wet weather and calibration and pumps. So, but we do want to start covering modeling. So knowing and expecting that a big uh, group of you are modelers, or at least are comfortable admitting that you're a modeler, I've opened up a poll just asking for your where you are in the spectrum right, of, of modeling. Uh, you know, brand new, relatively new, been here for a while and want to just see a few new things or been here for quite a long time. I want to make sure I don't try to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. It's where, where the spectrum is. And I'll let this run just for a little bit more. This is the last poll so you can rest your fingers after this one. Excellent. It's neck and neck. I don't have a dog in a fight though, so I will close it and share it with you. So two-thirds or so, somewhere in roughly a year to five years, and that's good. Um, and certainly with, with my level of experience, I'm not here to tell you I know everything. Um, I'm always learning new things, and I'm always interested in learning new things, so I appreciate uh, you being here. I, I was struck in the first five to ten years of my professional life working as consultants, the amount of things that weren't necessarily that intuitive but just aren't really captured in an academic sense. It's just hard to pick that up in any way other than just finding a project that happens to have it. Um, and you can't always find all those projects. All right, so let's try to jump back in. So we're back on the modeling side of things. So we talked about the physical aspects of the pipes. Now we're moving that over to this L concept of the limbs. And this is where a lot of people can be overwhelmed or frightened because a lot of times when you start getting into uh, the limbs or how the modeling system wants to do work with that, you start getting a lot of terms, a lot of mathematics involved. You start considering, uh, well, if I'm, if I'm really thinking about how flow happens, well, I know that friction has an impact, gravity has some impact, although it's kind of an overall impact. Pressure could be an impact, especially if I you know, have a level of surcharging. But then you might hear terms like local acceleration or convective acceleration. You might even dig deep enough to be presented with a substantial differential equation that can help tell you exactly how to estimate flow. Maybe you'll even jump in uh, some finite ele element work. And usually people go one of two ways when they see that. They either go back to school and get an advanced degree because they love the theoretical part, or they get kind of a tired head and, and run or walk away from that. So I'm here to say that we can take this term, which is a great term, and vastly simplify it. For you as a modeler, for most of what you do will be simplified down to just a few physically based factors, right? So we already talked about obviously diameter would have an impact. A 100 inch line is going to flow more than a, a 12 inch line, all things being equal. Slope, again, same idea, will have under most conditions, as long as you're not under a massive backwater condition. In other words, as long as you're not really submerged, slope will make a difference. The roughness will too. And that should also be somewhat intuitive. And then you might have minor losses. Um, although a lot of times, from a modeling standpoint, we usually gloss over minor losses and attribute those to roughness. We'll cover that a little bit more in the concept of calibration, but if you're calibrating to actual data, 
you have a certain level of knowledge in, in how good that data is, and generally things like minor losses kind of get lost in the shuffle of how good your data is for comparison purposes. So in this example, you see a screenshot of a lot of information, but basically that's everything you need to know for most of what a limb is for a pipe. In this case, you see an upstream and downstream diameter, excuse me, upstream and downstream invert, so the elevation of the bottom of the pipe. That's the invert elevation. Not as much when you see the crown elevation, which is the top of the pipe, although you could obviously calculate that just from looking at the diameter here being 18 inches or 1.5 feet. You can see the slope. You can see a Manning's end value, so you have a roughness. We talked about before how a manhole can have several different lines that might drop in. So the node in the modeling term, that's what connects um, two nodes are connected by a link. So the node has a ground elevation. So on the, on the right node there, you see it at 634, and the invert is 631. So a very shallow one, only three feet deep in this example. And half of that is the diameter of the pipe. So very, very shallow, only 18 inches deep as far as cover goes in this. Um, so everything you can see there in, in this, that's what the model needs in minimum to execute and be able to determine the capacity or route flow. Those should all be physically based to you. Uh, same idea for the nodes. This is zooming in on a different node. Same concept, the spill crest, or what happens to um, at the ground level. And then you have a couple of decisions to make, and these are related to that pressure idea. So if I have a manhole um, upstream and downstream of a pipe, I need to tell the model what to do when the water hits the top of the manhole and it hits the rim of the manhole. I don't have to tell the world what to do. The world has its own laws and knows what to do with the water, but the model doesn't. So I need to tell the model one of three things, generally speaking. The first one is, if it hits the top of the manhole, I want it to just disappear into space. I want it to be transported to Mars and act like it was never there. That's one option. Um, hard to do that in the real world, but quite easy to do that in the modeling world. Uh, another option is to seal that, and that actually does happen at times in the real world. If you've seen a manhole that's been um, sealed and maybe there's a gasket and it's been bolted shut, so you're basically allowing pressure to build up in that manhole. The other option you can have, although you see this more in stormwater than in sanitary, is to go ahead and let it build up and spill out like it would in, in normal conditions, but begin to pond up, and so it's kind of in a way in between the first two options. So usually you'll see um, an option of none or sealed when you're talking about what happens at a node. And a little bit on the solution type again, and I think I have maybe this under the logic part, but some of those more advanced terms actually can be fiddled with inside a lot of the modeling engines. So if you really want to mess with time steps and tolerances. Those are more advanced ideas. It's not really an intro subject, but you do have some control over the more theoretical way the model would uh, run. So let's talk about the loads. So that's kind of the quick intro into the pipes. Again, in the comment sections, if you say, no, I don't, that's not good enough, we need more about how the pipes work, then by all means, we can cover that in a later section. But we'll skip over to the loads. So if you recall, there were three loads we talked about. And this is time basis. So from a time variation, there's the seasonal load. We covered that as more of like a groundwater effect. So in this example, you can see the idea of a water table and where my pipe is relative to the water table. In fact, some systems will allow you to be pretty specific about that. So I can tell the system how much rain falls out of the sky. And once it hits the ground, how much might then evapotranspirate up and how much of it might run off and how much might percolate down into the groundwater table and where that table is and how to treat it. So you can be very physically based in this, which is really nice because at the end of the day, one of these tools when we go and do all this work is to help support some pretty big capital decisions. So it's quite nice to be able to come back and point to some physical based evidence and why you made those decisions instead of using round numbers like multipliers of three just because it kind of works. So it, so that can be done, and that's on a seasonal basis. And So you can use that, or you may even say, we don't have that. The groundwater table is 300 feet deep where, our, where my uh, utility is. We never have to worry about groundwater. We only need to worry about dry weather. And so dry weather, again, it's a concept of I get up at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning and I take a shower. My neighbor gets up at 6.30 and runs a load of dishes, et cetera, et cetera. If you aggregate all those uses, and those variations of sewer flow by time, you'll get some type of diurnal pattern. 
and that will probably vary from the week to the weekend, right? So I don't get up and come to the office to take a shower on Saturday, nor do I leave the office to go home to use the bathroom through the week. So those, my use of flow changes over time, and the model has the ability to do the same thing. And that can also be based, you see on the, the top screen there, that can also be very physically based. So I can base not only that temporal variation, so that is a, a unit variation over time. So the area under that curve should be one, I'm not adding or taking out flow, but the magnitude of my flow can change, and it can change on things like land use. So residential versus commercial versus industrial. The flow rate itself can vary, and that may also vary on things like the area. So if I have a unit or a nominal flow rate, that could change based on how big the area that is served by that manhole, similar with density. So all things that you can add up and aggregate together to help characterize this dry weather flow. And some of the systems that I have many different dry weather flows. So I might have one dry weather flow for the residential area and one for a uh, mixed use area. And again, if you think about it, that's really nice because if I have an existing conditions model that has low density residential in an area, and in future conditions, the only change to my model is that we've rezoned that to be um, mixed use urban. Well, that land use has changed, which means we expect the loading to be different. Well, if we change a few parameters, we can just have the model change the loading. And that way, again, very physically based, you know, if we have estimates of population gain every five and ten year planning cycle, we can tie that back to the model rather than just kind of more nebulous or arbitrary estimates of uh, additional flow. That's easier to characterize, which is good, because once you get into wet weather, that can be more difficult. Here's an example of that dry weather pattern we saw before, um, and that's kind of the magenta line. You can see a, a slight diurnal pattern. So you can see that in the middle of the night, not that many people are doing things, but in this case, it's not zero. So even though I'm talking about wet weather here, the fact that that magenta line never hits zero tells you there's always flow in the system, probably a base flow or a seasonal groundwater flow. But you have the minimums. And then you have the two humped pattern there. So you have the hump, this obviously more of a residential area. You have the, the morning hump, everyone getting ready for work. It tails off during the day, it peaks up again around dinner time, you know, preparing food, running dishwasher, things like that, and then drops off again. At the top of this, you can see some uh, bar chart or bar lines of rainfall. And so around day two, there's a small event at the top of the graph, which you can see a response so all of a sudden, you have the dark blue line, which is extra flow. On top of the base flow, it's this inflow and infiltration. Look at day seven, there's a lot more rain, there's a lot more flow. In fact, in very general terms, you have, what, three times as much flow from that rainfall event on the seventh day than you do from base flow, which is why, generally speaking, it's the wet weather event that drives the capacity not only of your collection system, but any of your facilities, your lift stations, your wet wells. So that's why you have two or three pumps at the lift station and only operate one at a time, because under seven of the eight days you only need to operate one, but on the eighth day you certainly need to operate more than one. What does that look like in the model? Well, there's many different ways you can do that. Again, I've alluded to the fact that you can do some pretty cursory analysis just by maybe adding a new quote-unquote dry weather flow that's not really dry weather. You could multiply your dry weather by an integer value or decimal value. Those are okay. There's no way to extrapolate into the future what's happening, and there's no real way to know the volume of flow. So the model allows you to do something really nice that a spreadsheet wouldn't allow you to do, which is to actually have the model respond to real events. Two main ways you could do that. One way is, to, especially if you're a hydrologist, if you really like hydrology, then you can go to town on the hydrology. You can come up with the rainfall distribution and the routing method, and you can do lots of good work on characterizing how the water will fall out of the sky and flow through the system, and then you can take a percentage of that flow and take it from the runoff concept into your sanitary sewer system. That's certainly a valid way of doing things. A lot of the sanitary modelers who aren't hydrologists prefer a simpler approach, which is called the RTK method. And, and it's similar in, in that there's an R factor, which is the fraction of rainfall. So that basically says some small fraction of rainfall will get into my system. The T and the K are shape factors on unit hydrographs. So these are triangular unit hydrographs. There's three of them. 
One of them is for the short term, so the idea of the person who thought it would be easier to connect their downspout to the sewer system than it would be to build a French drain. Uh, that's just short-term response. If it rains, that's going to get into the sewer system really fast. But conceptually, that is going to act and behave and um, propagate through the system differently than a medium-term response, which might be that brick manhole you saw that has a lot of squirter lines coming in when it rains, or maybe that manhole that has access holes that go all the way through the manhole, and the manhole's in the street, and the street is the conveyance method, right? So that might be more of a medium, short to medium term. And then you might have that idea of water percolating down through the system and in through cracks, so a longer term. Um, so that's something we'll cover again more in both wet weather and in calibration, but certainly there are ways to take into account what's happening. And then, of course, you have the spatial. So everything we just talked about is time variation. Spatial makes a difference. We covered that a little bit in the dry weather, but certainly you'd like to be able to apply different characteristics to different areas of your system and have a logical way to do that. Didn't really cover GIS. Certainly GIS is well entrained in uh, sanitary models, and that's a, one of many great areas where if you have sewer sheds and you intersect that with land use or other things, then you can just apply that to your manholes and have, again, a very physically based representation of what's happening in the system. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit more on um, some of the logic. So we're getting close on, on uh, where we are uh, in our talk, but we want to talk about logic. So the first one is the concept of kind of a passive logic, uh, one being the boundary conditions you set. And the boundary conditions, well, you'll have to pick at least two. Um, one will be the outfall. So at some point in your model, there needs to be a way for the water that you generate to disappear um, into uh, imaginary land. So that may be at the headworks of your wastewater treatment plant. So maybe there's a pump station, a wet well there. Um, it could be if you are not treating it, but you're providing it to a regional treater. Uh, maybe it is a meter station or otherwise. But there's some area that has an elevation and it has a behavior that is the downstream boundary condition. And then you also have initial conditions, usually. Now, if you run a model under over a really long time frame, that initial condition becomes gradually less important, but you have some concept of what level is my initial level in my wet well? Is it empty or is it full? Because if it's full and then I add a lot of flow, everything downstream will be different than if it's empty and I add a lot of flow. And of course, all your other decisions that you've made over time, what your roughnesses are, what your operational controls are for your pump stations, things like that, those are all, in a way, passive conditions and passive controls, passive logic. But really what we're talking about when we talk about this kind of logic uh, aspect is the active logic. So those are the real-time control devices, the biggest one being, of course, the pumps. If you have pumps in your system, those are the biggest things that are going to turn on and off and affect what happens. Those aren't the only ones, so we'll cover that in more detail in a later talk, but you can have other flow control devices. So perhaps you have some type of uh, valve, maybe you have a, a knife valve or some other valve that can control flow, or you have a weir that has a different settings. So any way that you can control or shape flow, and models are usually pretty good about that. So you have a full control device, like a pump, and you have a sensor that actually tells that pump how to work. So that might be the level indicator in the wet well. That's really good, especially if you're running a model for, let's say, five years of model simulation time. You don't want to have to tell it to turn on and off at 2 o'clock every day because it changes every day based on how much flow there is and the diurnal patterns. It's much easier to tell the, the pump to turn on at 8 feet of water and turn off at 6 feet of water. It just makes more sense for it to be able to run its own logic. So that is a lot of talk and a lot of energy expounded on basically up into the moment where you would hit run, right? And we probably spend some time on the errors and other issues you may have once you hit run. But let's assume we've even cleared that hurdle and we can hit run and we can analyze a system and actually get a result. That's a lot of effort. So why do we do that? Well, there's two main reasons to create a model, in my opinion. You can summarize it down to two. One of it is to validate what you think you already know. So if you've got a model and you think that you have problems in one area of the system, you can put everything in the model and then you can run different uh, 
uh, scenarios on that and you can see the results. Do I have problems there or not? Yes, the model says that under all these different conditions I have surcharging and overflow. So that's a great way. The other way is um, projections, of course. What ifs? What if I took this lift station and directed the flow over here? What would happen? Well, obviously it's much easier to have a few model clicks in a different scenario to execute and review those results than it is to actually bench scale test that or actually build it. And of course you get lots of good results independent of that. So here's a just a few simplified examples. So here's a nice plan view showing um, the depth of flow in a node. So in this case you may say, oh, the blue, just for the purpose of the discussion, if the blue, the dark blue, was a problem, then perhaps there is some uh, concern with the material of that pipe and it happens to be right next to a big body of water, so maybe there's an issue or otherwise. In this case, you, know, there, you can see the progression of color, fl the flow, like a lot of areas, it goes from north to south, so you can see it flow through there. So you can visually convey what you can't with just a spreadsheet or just um, kind of institutional theoretical knowledge. This can be at a specific time in a specific place. Of course, you could see that in plots of individual links. So we talked earlier about that minimum velocity for maintenance. Well, okay, well, we say it's roughly two feet per second. Well, the flow changes throughout the day. So if the flow changes, it stands to reason that the velocity will change too. So here's a great example. Once the system's up and running, oh, I see it gets down to less than one feet per second. Hmm, I wonder if that's good enough. Are we going to have problems there? Because I can tell you that you don't want to have that on a two-year short cycle of cleaning if you have to clean your whole system anyway. And in fact, you can, in more advanced systems, you can actually put in the particle size distribution, and you can find those type of things, um, some more stylized versions, or you could do your own work to calculate your own, and you could really actually calculate theoretical suspension and uh, deposition of your um, suspended particles. So that's a really nice feature to have. And then you can see if I can play this, if it'll go through, you can see some animation, some real quick animation of basically everything all at once. Right? So in this little area, I have the profile view, I have the section view, I have the hydrographs, and I have the table view all in the same view, if that's something I want to see. Well, that's really hard to conceptualize any other way but with a model. So you go through this effort and you lovingly create your model, and hopefully you're happy with it to some level, and then you can generate some good results. At this point, we're about to wrap it up on this one. I do want to say that there's a whole talk I gave uh, dedicated just to sewer problems and their solutions. There's a short link to it. It's a pre-recorded one like this, so watch it if you're interested. It basically covers the four main topics because we've kind of inferred that the only topic here was capacity when, in, in fact, a model can help solve lots of different questions, regulatory, maintenance, capacity, and growth in others. Um, but we just don't have the time to cover all those in this one, so that's a webinar just covering, again, the, the reasons you might want to use one. So for no other reason, if you have the need from time to time to justify the modeling budget you have and the value that a model can, can give you, again, you've got a friend who can try to tell you um, what you can use the model for. Uh, at the beginning, you were told that you can have the option to put in some comments or questions. Certainly feel free to do that. Um, that's my email address. By all means, drop me a line if you have interest. I think we're expecting these to be roughly every six weeks. Um, so the next one, just on wet weather. Right? Adam's 45-minute talk strictly on the wet weather aspects will be next uh, term, and we'll continue to move through. So especially if you have any specific wet weather comments or questions, let me know, and I'll build that into the actual webinar itself. Appreciate you coming and listening. I hope that you found some value in that, and I wish you good luck in all of your sanitary sewer modeling endeavors. Thanks a lot.